Please pray with me. Life-giving God, take our minds and think through them. Take our mouths and speak through them. Take our hearts, fill with resurrection hope, and set them ablaze with your love. Amen. Please be seated. When Jesus speaks, change happens. Last week we discussed unbelief and embodied it in the person of Thomas. We called him doubting or unbelieving Thomas. He had to see and to a degree experience the person of the resurrected Jesus in order to believe. John's account of Thomas prompted us to think of ourselves and how we are in some ways just like him. Not because we are, quote, unholy, but because we are human, and humans have an innate ability to doubt, to question, and challenge. God did not make us robots. We're also reminded that we, like the first disciples, are resurrection people. We believe in the resurrection, or some of us believe in elements of the resurrection. And some of us believe in the concept of the resurrection. It gives us hope, courage, and reminds us of grace and God's unconditional love. But then John's account appears to have ended with the rationale of why his maverick gospel was written. We are told Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that indeed Jesus is the Messiah, and through him you may have life. End of chapter 20, end of the Gospel of John. But wait, not so quick. There's a sort of a one-chapter addendum or epilogue that seems to be tagged on. Did John forget to include this? Nope. And not to throw you off, but this addition, as some scholars believe, feel came not from John, but from John's community, and hence that sort of addition at the end. Isn't life just like this additional chapter? We think that we have things all tidied up and planned well, then a glitch or two or three throws us off edge. Or something happens, we forget to include it in our original narrative. And then we add it somewhere else. It's not different from the story, but it just seems a tad out of place. I wonder, and this is me thinking now, since we encourage questions and thought, if there was some sort of disagreement in the Jehani community as to where the gospel should actually have ended. Maybe some felt that two appearances of Jesus was more than enough proof. And we didn't need a third one. Did they debate whose personality would leave a lasting impression in the context of chapter 20? For here, in chapter 21, we have not Thomas, but we have the most talked about disciple again as our chapter protagonist, the great denier, Peter. We've heard so much about him over the years. We recall how he blunders, and despite his pre con crucifixion comment that he would rather die than forsake Jesus. He lied and he denied Jesus three times leading up to the crucifixion. So why does Thomas get the moniker of doubting Thomas but Peter doesn't get the moniker denying Peter? It was only days before that Peter, Thomas, and others were locked away fearful in a room. Then the resurrected Jesus came to them, offering hope and new opportunities. One would say that they almost experienced a new type of life, perhaps some sort of a conversion. They, therefore, should have burst out of that room with renewed confidence and spiritual empowerment as they were commissioned by Jesus to do. 
reminding them that God was indeed sending it. Instead, Peter decided that he was not going to burst out of these gates. He was going to go fishing. The others, yes, including Thomas and James, those two brothers, sons of thunder, joined him. In total, there were seven. Where were the others? Again, we have no idea. What a crew. What were they thinking? We are here at a loss for information. What do we do when we have come through a trying life experience? When it seemed like all possibilities were non-existent. And then suddenly, there is a burst or even a ray of sunshine, a ray of hope. I think that we may want to share that good news and joy and excitement with others and not keep it within ourselves or within our own circle. But we are not Peter and we're certainly not one of the other disciples. They in turn return to their previous profession only to discover that they weren't that good at it either. The trip was a disaster, as scripture tells us. They ignored the fact that the encounter that they had with Jesus gave them a greater mission. But human nature is like that at times. Is it possible that the disciples are confused? They can't go back to their roles as the disciples because they're afraid still. They don't have a leader. But they don't know the way forward either. In this state of being, Jesus again speaks to them. John 21 recounts oddly that eventually the disciples recognized Jesus by the Sea of Tiberias, but were afraid to ask him who he was. Perhaps they were embarrassed to be found trying to fish rather than actually preaching, which is what they were supposed to be doing. Or how many of us as youngsters may recall, an adult who told us to do something, but we ignored it and did instead what we wanted. Such would warrant, in some cases, a serious sit-down conversation, or, if you're young enough, for time out. The disciples, you see, were on a journey of discovery. They had to recover the habits of discipleship that they had practiced for three years the regular experiences of God intruding on the ordinary, followed by lengthy discussion about seeing the difference God's grace makes in the lives of people who encounter acts of love and kindness. But it seems that they were again having trouble. They were without their leader. And like a ship without a rudder, they were drifting. Yet, as first-generation resurrection people, they should have known better. Or perhaps maybe I'm being a little too harsh. And here comes Jesus again. He didn't condemn them, but he asked the question. Or he may have wanted to ask a question. Didn't I tell you to go out into the world and share good news? But what does he do instead? He invites them to bring their fish and join for dinner. He is the host who extends hospitality. Then he had a private conversation with Peter. Does it seem to you that, as of late in this gospel, that Jesus often asks Peter questions in threes? Yet, Jesus is also preparing Peter for greater things. Jesus, as our scripture text tells us, after asking Peter, do you love me? He's instructed, feed my lambs. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. In other words, be a shepherd, be a leader. But Peter had to listen. In stark contrast to Peter in John's gospel, we have Saul. Saul, the persecutor of the early church, converted to Paul. God spoke in a very different way. We have somebody who is out to actually kill the early church members. They are not believing the same way as, as he was believing. And he wanted to ensure that the Jewish way was to be kept as pure as is possible. And out he goes. He goes out, and ironically enough, he is 
on his way, seeking the early Christians who are called people of the way. And out of that journey, he is struck down. What does he do? He's stunned. A voice is heard. Doesn't see anyone. Calls him by name. Saul, Saul. And obviously he's shocked and he doesn't see anybody. Who is this? This is Jesus who you are persecuting. And change starts to come. Saul lost his vision. His vision until he was reconnected in a very different way to that voice that spoke to him. So I said all of that to say that God speaks to us in different ways. Through a child, through nature, through an animal. I could go on and on, but why don't you pause for a moment? How has God spoken to you? This may be one of those moments when you have a question. What does Randy mean by God speaking to me? Or, God doesn't speak to me. How come? Or, this is so far-fetched. Someone I can't see speaking to me? And that's why we're here. If you remember our welcome, we encourage you to bring those questions. We may not have all the answers, but we will certainly journey with you. Please allow me a personal share. I have known as a baptized Anglican that I was called to the priesthood since I was a teenager. The call came after I had left the Anglican church and decided again to enjoy the music and worship experience of a Pentecostal church. So I had a born-again experience. Although felt a call, I never followed up. That was my Peter experience. I instead went into teaching. The call came in different ways. It never stopped, and none were solicited by me. Family. Affirmed to various congregants in at least three different denominations. Confirmed by ministers and, and priests, friends, and through weird things that God seems to let happen. Like Peter, I did it my way. I wanted to go on my own way. And gradually over time, still with my questions, I acquiesced to God's call. And to my great surprise, back in the Anglican church where I started. That's why I'm here with you this morning. And while I see myself in Peter, my experience is also somewhat connected to Paul. No, I didn't lose my sight for several days, but a voice of God, or indeed Jesus, was distinctly clear to me. Yesterday when I was out in my garden doing the composting thing, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't the fumes from the compost, I felt a tug on my heart. And that tug is, and some of you may have already heard this, to share my period of discernment and call to clergy ministry with you. I am like Paul responding to a direct statement. So here it is. It was Monday, Thursday night. As a clergy student, I was on an internship at a parish in Toronto. We had washed our feet and we had broken our meal, everything we had done typically by Monday, Thursday standards. It was left up to me to lock up. And everyone was downstairs and leaving. I was shutting out the lights. As I shut out the light at the back of, or at the front of the church, was a huge cross. Ginormous cross. And I looked at it. I was drawn to this cross. It wasn't the first time I had seen it. 
I sat down in a chair and thought I would spend some time, quiet time. And before I knew it, I was no longer in the chair. No, I didn't fall off. I was on my knees and praying. It was the most unforgettable, powerful experience that I had experienced beyond my call in my life. God spoke, confirmed my call to ministry. And today, again, I am reaffirming that call just like Paul. That night, none of those confirming voices were anywhere near to me. It was the dark, it was God, it was the cross, it was me. And that's why I'm here with you today. Beloved, I bet if we slowed down a little, listened a little more, looked about and with eyes of curiosity, we would be surprised by the way God speaks to us in our hearts and in our minds, through art, through music, through song, through exercise, through drama, through social justice, equity marches, volunteering, and so much more. So I end this reflection with a scripture that has spoken deeply to me in the past, but it was recently revived by a close friend who long ago confirmed my call to priestly ministry. It's part of my continued discernment. It's part of God continuing to speak to me. And here it is. It's from the prophet Jeremiah. For I know the plans I have for you, declares God. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God doesn't just speak to one or two of us. God, Jesus, continues to speak to all of us in love and compassion. Will you recognize the voice? Will you recognize the call? How will you respond? When God speaks to us, God also speaks through us. And during these most unusual of social, political, and environmental times, God's voice may be the only voice of true reason. Amen.